just before 5 p.m. You might have felt it. Lots of people in Spokane did. Let's get right over to Mayor Kawash, who has more on this earthquake so far, Mayor. Yeah, we didn't feel it in the station here, but everyone else in Spokane did. The United States Geological Survey says it was a 6.5 earthquake that hit near Chalice, Idaho. That's just north of Boise. The earthquake was about six miles underground, so it's considered a shallow one. Those are usually more damaging than ones that start deeper in the earth. Now, we'll give you a closer look at it here. 6.5 is considered a strong earthquake with the potential to cause a lot of damage in heavy populated areas, but that doesn't appear to be the case for this one. So far, no reports of damage or injury, just a lot of shaking around these parts. There was a 4.8 aftershock from this earthquake about five miles southwest of Chalice, and we just saw another one that is about 3.6. We've heard several reports of people feeling the earthquake here in Spokane, in North Idaho, all the way in Missoula, Montana. It's still going. It's still going. Yeah, I, yeah I, I should let you go. Oh. Well, it is that time of year where we start to ramp up in looking at the forecast for the Atlantic hurricane season, right? And Colorado State University just came out with their forecast for this year. They're one of the premier forecasters for this type of thing, kind of the long-term outlook for Atlantic hurricane season. Uh, this year, what they're thinking is 16 total named storms, eight of those being hurricanes and four of those being major hurricanes, meaning category three or higher. Now, compared to last year, it's actually pretty similar. We had 18 named storms last year, Six hurricanes, three of those are major hurricanes. Here's the thing with this forecast that you have to keep in mind. It really doesn't matter all that much. It's kind of a pointless forecast because it only takes one, all right? You could have a year where you have 30 hurricanes, a lot of major hurricanes, and they all stay out to sea. But you could also have a year where you have only two hurricanes, and one of them was major, and one of them is a direct hit on Miami. So the point is these numbers really don't matter very much. You've just got to be prepared for hurricane season if you live in one of those prone spots. Of course, starting with the latest developments on the coronavirus pandemic. So let's get right to it. Yeah, that's right. Here's what we know right now with the CDC has changed its recommendations and is now advising Americans to wear non medical face coverings when outside. Nine states have issued formal stay at home orders, despite the nation's top infectious disease expert, Dr. Anthony Fauci, saying he's concerned not all states are doing so. And President Trump is using the Defense Production Act to prohibit the export of scarce medical. Supplies. This says coronavirus cases here in New York City jumped by more than 6,000 in a single day. We have team coverage this morning from New York to Washington, and we begin with ABC's Stephanie Ramos right here in Times Square. Stephanie, good morning to you. Dan, good morning. Another 500 people here in New York City have died in the last 48 hours due to coronavirus while hospitals are at their max. The CDC's advice to everyone across the country now, wear a face covering if you're going out in public. This morning, new guidance on face masks. The CDC and President Trump advising Americans to wear face coverings if they need to leave home in order to stop the spread of the coronavirus. But despite the CDC's recommendation, the president says he won't do it. I just don't want to wear one myself. It's a recommendation. They recommend it. Uh, I'm feeling good. The number of deaths surging in the U.S. New York experiencing its deadliest day yet in the COVID-19 outbreak. The death toll up by 562, now standing at nearly 3,000, with more than 100,000 people now testing positive for the virus. The state announcing it's deploying the National Guard to redistribute medical equipment, including ventilators from institutions that aren't currently using them. We could have people dying because there were no ventilators, but there are hospitals in other parts of the state that have ventilators that they're not using. 
In New York City, the epicenter of the outbreak in the U.S., emergency alerts calling for licensed health care workers to help treat an expected surge in new patients this weekend. This Sunday, April 5th, is an absolutely essential day as we prepare for a very, very difficult week ahead. And I've called to arms all New Yorkers who can help in this fight. In nearby New Jersey, cases still soaring. The governor ordering all flags at half staff to honor those who have died from COVID-19. The surge also being felt in Florida, where confirmed cases have gone up by 20% in one day. And in Louisiana, where the governor says they'll run out of hospital beds by next week. In California, Governor Gavin Newsom announcing a new initiative to house the homeless population in vacant hotel rooms across the state. If you've just been identified as positive in a homeless shelter, we need to get you out immediately, get you into an isolation unit, into a hotel unit. In Sacramento, more than 70 members of a church congregation, including three pastors, sickened with the virus, despite holding services remotely. In Detroit, drive through testing is already underway, but first responders and some workers are now being tested with new rapid testing kits that can deliver results in as little as 15 minutes. But the Motor City announcing the death of a city bus driver, Jason Hargrove, who succumbed to the virus. Hargrove posted a message on Facebook last month voicing his frustration at people who didn't follow stay-at-home orders and used public transportation while they were exhibiting symptoms. And we out here as public workers doing our job, trying to make an honest living. It's folks dying from this. At some point in time, we got to draw the line and say enough is enough. But there are glimmers of hope. Back in New York City, the rival New England Patriots, a welcome sight for once. The team delivering 300,000 N95 masks to the Javits Center Field Hospital, all thanks to Pat's owner, Robert Kraft. And in Virginia, one family sharing their blessings with others. Buying groceries at the store for at least 30 people in line. We were just really glad to do it. When everybody was cheering and clapping, it was, I can't tell you just how exciting it was to watch people really get some help and be happy. And standing here in Times Square where the streets are pretty much deserted, that's odd. Knowing that hundreds of people are at home waiting for this storm to blow over. It is all eerie. It is hard. But one thing we can do is remember the faces of the pandemic, loved ones, first responders, and the doctors on the front line. This is truly an unprecedented situation. This virus doesn't discriminate. It attacks everyone. I want every American to be prepared for the hard days that lie ahead. The coronavirus has changed life as we know it across America. But how did we go from zero cases to having more than any other country? The timeline starts on January 21st, when Washington State reports the first coronavirus case in the United States. This is certainly not a moment for panic or high anxiety. It is a moment for vigilance. Within a week, the CDC confirms Illinois, California, and Arizona also have cases. And on January 30th, Chicago witnesses the first person-to-person -person transmission in the country. The following day, Health and Human Services Secretary Alex Azar makes this announcement. I have today declared that the coronavirus presents a public health emergency in the United States. The U.S. also starts denying entry for most foreign nationals who recently traveled to China. By February 17th, confirmed coronavirus cases in the U.S. increased to 15. One week later, the stock market begins to drop, and the CDC reports a case in California with no known travel history. This particular case could be the first possible instance of community transmission of COVID-19 in the United States. Meanwhile, President Trump says this at a press conference. It's going to disappear. One day it's like a miracle. It will disappear. The next day, Washington reports the first coronavirus-related death in the country. They become the first state to issue a state of emergency. Several states follow as we enter the month of March. A public health emergency. A declaration of emergency. State of emergency. The Senate also passes an $8.3 billion emergency spending bill. And by March 8th, confirmed U.S. coronavirus cases reach the 500 mark. The World Health Organization then declares this three days later. COVID-19 can be characterized as a pandemic. Meanwhile, several colleges take their classes online and sports leagues start suspending seasons. Then a major announcement from President Trump. We will be suspending all travel from Europe. 
That ended up not applying to U.S. citizens, but many Americans still scrambled to get home. Then this happens at the Rose Garden. I am officially declaring a national emergency. And on March 13th, Louisiana becomes the first of several states to postpone their presidential primary. At this point, over 30 states issue school closures and people start panic buying in stores. It was quite crowded and we had to wait outside for about 20 minutes before they let us in. Jumping to March 16th, scientists in Washington launch the first human trial for a potential vaccine. And the White House recommends people avoid bars, restaurants, and groups of 10 or more. Then, the Bay Area tells residents to stay home, barring essential needs. It's the first major U.S. city to enact a measure like this. And at this point, the coronavirus hits all 50 states. Then, the Senate approves a second relief bill. And the next day, California issues a statewide stay-at-home order. We are confident that the people of the state of California will abide by it. Several states soon follow suit. Stay at home. Stay home, stay safe. Quite simply, stay at home. By March 23rd, New York has emerged as the epicenter of the outbreak with over 20,000 cases. It's nonstop, literally. A lot of people come, they're not really survived, they expire. And Governor Cuomo announces the state will launch three new studies for potential coronavirus treatments. The following day, the White House asks New Yorkers to self-quarantine if they've recently left the state. Then, the World Health Organization warns the United States could become the world epicenter of the outbreak. Meanwhile, American coronavirus cases surpass that of China. And on March 27th, Congress signs off on another relief bill. This time, a historic $2 trillion stimulus package that'll issue $1,200 checks to many Americans, plus relief to corporate America and small businesses. That all brings us to the week of March 30th. The USNS Comfort Hospital ship docks in New York President Trump extends social distancing guidelines through April. Wall Street finishes one of its worst quarters in stock market history. U.S. coronavirus cases hit 250,000. Retired healthcare workers re-enter the workforce, including more than 25,000 volunteers in California. And in the last two weeks of the month, almost 10 million people file new unemployment claims. Roughly two and a half months have gone by from that first case in Washington to where we are today. As always, we'll be keeping track of this story as it evolves to give you the latest headlines, numbers, and details to help you stay informed. Now, the World Bank has pledged $1 billion to India to help tackle the coronavirus pandemic there. More than 2,500 infections have now been confirmed in the country, and more than 70 people are now known to have died. The city of Mumbai has some of the highest numbers of patients in India, with many living in congested slums, sparking fears the virus could rapidly spread further. Yogita Lamai has more details. The virus has reached here, Asia's biggest slum and the most densely populated area on Earth, Dharavi. Nearly a million people live in less than a square mile. Social distancing is next to impossible. People are extremely scared here. If Italy's healthcare system, which is ranked second in the world, couldn't cope, India is far behind them. Here in Dharavi, as well as in other slums of the city, people have tested positive for coronavirus. Once that happens, they usually try to seal the area and then go door to door to check who else might be infected. But you can imagine the challenge the government faces trying to trace the spread of the infection in cramped spaces like these. The number of cases are doubling every three days now. The healthcare system is already struggling. A doctor treating COVID patients at a hospital that caters to at least 3 million people described the condition there. Fearful of speaking out, she didn't want her face to be shown. We are totally unprepared. In our institute, there are only six ventilators. So we have been finding ways where we can use one ventilator for two patients. It's very scary. All of us are just really overworked. There are so many places, rural setups, which lack basic healthcare facilities. They have no hospital. They have no doctors working there. And I think they are going to be hit the worst by this uh, illness. India's spending on healthcare is among the lowest in the world. A doctor here treats four times as many patients as one in the UK. 
and India has less than 11 ventilators per million people to treat COVID patients. If the virus is a threat, so is the stigma of contracting it. In the city of Indore, healthcare workers were attacked for trying to screen a woman. This stadium is being converted into an isolation centre. As are train coaches, today lying empty. The railways were shut down nearly two weeks ago, as was the rest of India. It took months for coronavirus to affect a million people around the world. If not contained in a country the size of India, that number could multiply very quickly. Yogita Lemay, BBC News, Mumbai. There are now more than a million confirmed cases of coronavirus in 181 countries, with Europe still the epicenter of the outbreak. Italy, with more than 14,000 dead, is the worst affected, but the daily mortality rate is coming down. Spain comes next, but it does have the highest number of confirmed coronavirus cases anywhere in Europe. And in France, the number of dead continues to rise, with deaths in care homes now being included in the figures. In Paris, police are strictly enforcing the government's tough quarantine measures over the Easter holidays. Railway stations, airports and major roads will be monitored to prevent people leaving the city. Lucy Williamson has more details. It's not only nations that thrive on liberty, epidemics too. At stations across Paris today, every journey began with a police check. Freedom of movement, a new national threat. Do you have your piece of paper? Of course. Ta -da -da. Yeah. <laughs> Johan made it through. He's on his way home to Brittany after two years abroad. But even the smallest mistake means being turned away. I wrote the wrong date, not today's date. And they've told me I need to go back home to prepare another form. I have to go to work, but I can't. France carried out almost six million checks during the first fortnight of confinement, far more than neighboring Italy, and it's issued more than 400,000 fines. But questions over when the confinement will end are growing. France's tough approach to the confinement runs the risk of losing public support if it becomes too harsh or too long. The Interior Minister has advised sensitivity in applying the rules and says the police operate differently in the countryside compared to the big cities, in the poorer suburbs compared to the towns. But the Paris police chief was forced to apologise today after taking a very different tone. The ones who are hospitalised today, the ones on life support now, are the ones that didn't respect the quarantine when it began. This is not a video game, it's real. There are dead people. With few life support beds left in the Paris region, patients are being sent across the country for care. This is now the worst hit region of France, but is there light at the end of the tunnel? If you ask me this question two days ago, uh, I, I should say no. There is a, a reduction in the in patients who come to the emergency ward and also the reduction of severe patients that came for a sign of COVID-19. Hafid says there were no new admissions to intensive care in his hospital today, a first since the epidemic began. The first glimpse of hope here after weeks of fear and frustration, the first sign that confinement might have worked. Lucy Williamson, BBC News, Paris. For more, we can cross to our Rome correspondent, Seema Gupta. Seema, more than 15,000 people now dead in Italy from COVID-19. From the way the numbers have been climbing, we knew this was coming. Can you bring us any signs of hope from the latest numbers? Well, you're absolutely right. I mean, that figure of 681 and bringing that figure of the number of deaths to more than 15,000, indeed tragic and heartbreaking figures. But the authorities and the officials are saying, well, it's mildly encouraging if you look at the entire trend and the figures in the last couple of days. First off, this is this figure of 681 in the last 24 hours, it's a drop from the day before. 
On top of that, the rate of new infections, it's more or less the same in the last couple of days. So it does confirm that stabilizing trend. On top of that, another very key figure that the officials were keen to stress today is that the, for the first time since the start of this emergency, we've seen a drop in the number of COVID-19 patients that have been admitted into intensive care. And this is significant, of course, because it means that it has a less of a stress and less of a pressure, a little bit less, on the healthcare system if they're not going into intensive care. All this said, basically means that it's moving in the right direction. But it's important to note that uh, moving in the right direction is stabilizing, but it's not declining. And that's why the lockdown measures still have to continue. Another interesting and sad uh, statistic to note as well is that 80 doctors so far have died as a result with this COVID-19 infection. Uh, the healthcare workers count for more than 11,000 uh, infections in the country. That means it's about 10% of the total, total number of people that are positive with COVID-19. Well, we can see behind you there that it's a beautiful sunny day in the Italian capital. Are Italians actually managing to follow the rules or are they suffering from cabin, cabin fever now at this point? Well, I think that's what the authorities are very concerned about. And we've been told that the number of patrols on the street will be increased precisely because of the good weather. And of course, we're leading up to Easter as well and Easter celebrations. Of course, we do not have the full on Easter celebrations in church and so on. But the authorities are saying, please, you can do all your commemorations from home. Uh, try to limit the number of people on the street. That said, though, we are seeing images of more people out, particularly in Naples, We've seen images in Genoa, uh, as well as in Milan. And uh, the authorities are saying the lockdown measures appear to be stabilizing, but you need to make sure that they don't blow up again and we have another increase. And that's a, a massive increase. And that's what they're concerned about. It's interesting to note as well that in the hardest hit region of Lombardy, uh, today they put in place that from tomorrow onwards, if you step out, you need to cover your face with a mask, which means you have to cover your mouth and your nose. So this is something they've put in place in that hardest hit region as well. Very keen to stress to people that now's not the time to let your guard down. There is concern this morning that the coronavirus could tighten its grip around the world well beyond summer. The United Nations said it will make a decision later this month on whether to delay its General Assembly meeting in New York, which is scheduled for September. The number of cases worldwide rose past one million. The virus is being blamed for more than 59,000 deaths. Roxana Saberi joins us from our London bureau with more. Roxana, good morning. Good morning, Dana. Spain is now reporting the second highest number of cases in the world after the U.S., but its daily death toll dropped for the second day in a row. Meanwhile, China, where the pandemic began, held a nationwide day of mourning. With sirens wailing and heads bowed, China stood still for three minutes today, mourning the country's victims killed by the coronavirus. Officially, the death toll here is more than 3,300. But claiming to now have the outbreak under control, China has started springing back to life. While in Europe, the death toll is soaring. For the first time, Spain reported more confirmed cases than Italy, where hope is growing as the rate of new infections has been slowing. We can all hope for better times, the Pope said at the Vatican last night. He said, even if we are isolated, thought and spirit can go far. And he called on his followers to stay home. The message is the same in the UK, where the death toll has jumped by more than 20 percent to over 3,600. Among the victims, two nurses in their 30s. I ask you to remember Amy and Arima. Please stay at home for them. On Friday, what will eventually be a 4,000-bed hospital for coronavirus patients opened in London, built out of a convention center in just nine days. 
With the UK nearing the end of its second week in lockdown, there have been some unexpected consequences. Wildlife roaming now deserted residential streets. Here in the UK, Prime Minister Boris Johnson says he's still self-isolating nine days after testing positive for the virus. Queen Elizabeth has been staying outside London at Windsor Castle. She's set to speak about the crisis tomorrow in a rare special address to the nation. In France, the number of dead from coronavirus continues to rise, nearly 600 deaths recorded in just 24 hours. Police are strictly enforcing the government's tough quarantine measures over the Easter holiday. In Paris, railway stations, airports and major roads will be monitored to prevent people leaving the city. Lucy Williamson reports. It's not only nations that thrive on liberty, epidemics too. At stations across Paris today, every journey began with a police check. Freedom of movement, a new national threat. Do you have your piece of paper? Of course. Ta -da -da. Yeah. <laughs> Johan made it through. He's on his way home to Brittany after two years abroad. But even the smallest mistake means being turned away. I wrote the wrong date, not today's date. And they've told me I need to go back home to prepare another form. I have to go to work, but I can't. France carried out almost six million checks during the first fortnight of confinement, far more than neighbouring Italy, and it's issued more than 400,000 fines. But questions over when the confinement will end are growing. France's tough approach to the confinement runs the risk of losing public support if it becomes too harsh or too long. The Interior Minister has advised sensitivity in applying the rules and says the police operate differently in the countryside compared to the big cities, in the poorer suburbs compared to the towns. But the Paris police chief was forced to apologise today after taking a very different tone. The ones who are hospitalised today, the ones on life support now, are the ones that didn't respect the quarantine when it began. This is not a video game, it's real. There are dead people. With few life support beds left in the Paris region, patients are being sent across the country for care. This is now the worst hit region of France, but is there light at the end of the tunnel? If you ask me this question two days ago, uh, I, I should say no. That there is a, a reduction in the in patients who come to the emergency ward and also the reduction of severe patients that came for a sign of COVID-19. Hafid says there were no new admissions to intensive care in his hospital today, a first since the epidemic began. The first glimpse of hope here after weeks of fear and frustration, the first sign that confinement might have worked. Lucy Williamson, BBC News, Paris. Just wanted to bring you um, some up-to-date figures while we're talking about Europe. In Spain, the number of recorded deaths from coronavirus has fallen for a second successive day. So they peaked on Thursday so far with, um, uh, with 950 deaths. The deaths overnight recorded uh, Spain Friday into Saturday, 809 Total number of deaths in Spain now stands at 11,744, just behind Italy. Uh, number of new cases in Spain also showed a uh, slowed slightly, with 7,026 people taking po testing positive, taking uh, the number who have uh, the infection to just over 124,500. Cari fratelli e sorelle, <coughs> nei giorni scorsi, il segretario generale delle Nazioni Unite ha lanciato un appello per un secciate il, fu il fuoco globale e immediato in tutti gli ang angoli del mondo, richiamando l'attuale emergenza per il Covid-19 che non conosce frontiere. Un appello al cessate il fuoco totale. Mi associo a quanti hanno accolto questo appello e invito tutti a darvi seguito, fermando ogni forma di ostilità bellica, favorendo la creazione di corridoi per l'aiuto umanitario, l'apertura alla diplomazia, l'attenzione a chi si trova in situazioni di più grande vulnerabilità. L'impegno congiunto contro la pandemia possa portare tutti a riconoscere il nostro bisogno di rafforzare i legami fraterni 
come membri di un'unica famiglia, in particolare susciti nei responsabili delle nazioni e nelle altre parti in causa, un rinnovato impegno al superamento delle rivalità. I conflitti non si risolvono attraverso la guerra. È necessario superare gli antagonismi e i contrasti mediante il dialogo e una costruttiva ricerca della pace. Angelus Domini, Nunziavit Marie. Et con...